Hello, everyone, and welcome to this UK Data Service webinar, Investigating Demographic Representation on Twitter. I'm Margarita Serrado, and I'm a Senior Communications and Impact Officer working for the UK Data Service. Presenting today is Luke Sloan. He's a Senior uh, Lecturer at Cardiff University and the Deputy Director of the Social Science Lab. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited to talk about what has become my pet topic. Um, my name is Luke Sloan. I said I work at the School of Social Sciences, Cardiff University. And for about three or four years now, I've been working um, looking at Twitter data. I mean, when this first started, Twitter data was um, quite new to the social sciences, and we were working on savaging burrows of coming empirical crisis and the idea that the social sciences needed to reinvigorate their methodological toolkit and think creatively about how this type of data can be used to understand social phenomena. And the, I remember at the time, the debate was always whether there's enough information in Twitter to do anything with it. So from that point, my stance has always been that Twitter data can be made more useful um, by understanding demographics, which says it allows us to ask more traditional social science questions. And for some platforms, there are demographics present, and for others, there aren't. And Twitter is one of those ones where there are signatures of demographics, of characteristics of age, of um, gender or sex, and of um, uh, social class and occupational hints. And we just need to find a way to get them out. And at Cardiff, we've got very good collaboration um, with the computer sciences as well, and together we found a few solutions. So what I want to talk about today, really, is some of the solutions we found for estimating demographic characteristics, um, inferred, if you like, from actual Twitter data rather than from a survey. Um, they're not perfect, but some of the evidence I'll show will suggest that we are classifying people correctly, and there's been some more recent work um, trying to cross-reference these with um, British Social Attitudes Survey 2015, and I'll talk a bit around that as well. So my fundamental stance is that I've done lots of work on Twitter, including trying to predict the general election. Um, if you want a story of the methodological woes of using Twitter to predict elections, I'd highly recommend that paper, which is basically full of us saying, we tried, but it didn't work, and here's why. Um, I'm also looking at lots of other things on the Welsh Assembly election and the horse food scandal, looking at crime sensing um, through social media, methods of crime disorder terms, linking it to prevalence of crime and so on. And all of these things can be enhanced by understanding demographics. You know, voting behaviour, um, intention to vote in relation to whether people actually vote is determined by demographic factors. Being victims of certain crime is determined by that as well. Um, the horsemeat scale will affect different demographic groups um, in various ways. For example, the person that normally does the shopping in the household, which is typically female, that may have different concerns to a male tweeter about horsemeat. It may or may not matter. In addition, age as to whether you're of the age where you may have a young family or whether you're retired or whether you're young will determine your reaction to food scares as well. And any, anything, all of these things benefit from knowing about someone's demographic characteristics. Okay. So, on the basis that social science primarily is interested in group differences and how they affect social behaviour, um, we want to be able to use Twitter data to explain social phenomena, to understand how they manifest in the virtual world. Okay. But there is nothing systematic. Um, Twitter has signatures of various demographic characteristics and various behavioural characteristics which are mediated through the technology and the platform. And one thing I'll say at the start, and I want to say it very clearly now, in case I don't make the point enough during the presentation, is that the, the nature of the technology and platform, in this case Twitter, has a huge mediating impact on how demographic signatures are picked up and how identity is expressed. So with all of this, we're looking really at how the real world is manifest in the virtual, but there's a lot in between about identity play, about deception, and sometimes just about people genuinely um, putting a typo. So if someone says in their profile that they're 300 years old and they meant to put 30, you know, not always deception, sometimes genuine mistakes. Okay. So overall, the, the general research questions that drive my interest, so what insights do demographic proxies off behavior on Twitter? Um, and then to kind of test that, 
if we think we can identify the demographic characteristics of individual users, then we would expect, based on that classification, to see differing patterns of behavior. And I'll show you an example of um, sentiment scores during the Olympics broken down by people we think are male and female, which suggests that the differences that we've identified, the categories we've identified, rather, are very real. And then that leads on to the do real world demographic differences manifest in the virtual world. So issues around um, social inequality based on social class, um, do they manifest online? Do people in, um, in the higher relative term, but the higher NSSEC, so social classes, um, have better networks? Or actually, is Twitter a democratizing medium that allows people who are typically disenfranchised to create a network of their own? You know, does, it, does it distort traditional understandings of networking connectivity, or does it just reproduce them in a virtual environment? So there's lots of questions, lots of things we can do if we can get hold of this demographic um, characteristics. So I'm going to talk about gender, a bit about location, a bit about age, and a bit about occupation. Okay, so one of the prime demographic characteristics of interest to social scientists is understanding whether someone's male or female. Now, I will use the term gender here because we're looking for virtual representations um, as opposed to sex, and the two are quite different in that sense. So the way we went about this, very simply, is looking for the first name of a user on Twitter. So when you access Twitter data, and I'm going to um, people know people don't know how to do this, so I apologize if I'm telling you something you already know, but it's quite critical, is when you access Twitter data from either a live feed or if you buy historical data, you don't just get the tweet. You get a whole load of information, such as the profile description field, how many people are following, links to profile images, and so on and so forth. It's called a JSON file, normally that's the format it comes in. And there is a lot more information itself, and that's actually in this metadata that a lot of the information that's in, of interest to me exists. Things like whether someone has geotagging switched on. So I'll cover this a bit later, but if someone switches on geotagging, we know the exact point, the latitude and longitude to the meter of where they were when they made that tweet, assuming it's from a mobile device. So when we think about Twitter data, how useful it is, its utility is linked not just to the content of the tweet, but everything else that comes with it, the metadata, if you like. Or increasingly, it's becoming mainstream data. So one of the things we get is the name of the person. And very simply, we can try and predict someone's, well, not predict, but categorize someone's gender into male, female, unisex, or unknown, based on that name. Um, you can look at the paper reference there if you're interested in this. There's a database of 40,000 names, and it has whether it's male, female, or unisex. And essentially, if you do some cleaning up of the text, if you teach some simple rules, and this is why it's so important to work with um, computer scientists and people skilled in the technology and the tool building for doing this, um, then you start to classify people. And of those we could identify as being male or female, the split is on Twitter of the UK population, as far as we can identify them, is 48.8% male and 51.2% female. And that is very close to the general prevalence of male or female in the population according to the 2011 census of 49.1 for men and 50.9 for women. Now, what I will say is that the recent work that I've done looking at the British Social Attitudes 2015 survey, we had a question on Twitter use there, and that is a proper probability, random probability sample survey with weighting to make it nationally representative. And it demonstrates, it's starting to hint, that actually there's a disproportionate number of men on Twitter. So about, off the top of my head, I think it's about 52% male. That means a few things. Um, we can be reasonably confident of that estimate, so it suggests that men may be more likely to use Twitter than women in general, or it might mean that there are more male names we can identify, and we can think back then to what that means. It could involve identity play. It could mean that female tweeters are less likely to put um, their name in their profile. What we're hinting at here is some difference in behavior, um, some idea that gender is an important factor in understanding Twitter use, even though the difference between the population at large is quite small. So, as with a lot of the things I identify the demographics, I think they generate more questions than they answer. 
and I would really encourage people to try and go away and answer those questions. I'd love to know why, for example, we might find more men on Twitter than women. That'd be really interesting to know from a behavioural perspective, and perhaps counterintuitive to some colleagues of what they would expect. Now, the next question is, obviously, a lot of people say, well, we're gauging identity play, matching names, looking for signatures, using algorithms. How do you know that you're picking up a real difference, that you're categorising people correctly? Well, we can only really test that by looking at some, um, some real-world event which is manifested somehow on Twitter by splitting people by male and female and seeing if their behaviour differs. And we tried this for the London Olympics. So what you can see now is a graph. Now, I, I apologise for the pink and blue, um, but I present this so often that I need a heuristic to help people understand what's going on. Um, so the jagged um, proper colour lines at the top of the graph are sentiment scores, and we've taken the average sentiment for every minute, and then we split it between male and female tweeters for those who could identify. So those who couldn't identify or unisex are excluded from this graph. Now, this is actually from Super Saturday when we won three gold medals. And what you can see is three peaks in sentiment on the pink line at the top, here, which actually correspond to real-world events. So when you look at the timeline, and this is another way of checking that there's a link between the real and the virtual world, is the first peak is when Farah starts his race, the second peak is when he moves to third place, and the final peak is when Jessica Ennis didn't win her medal, but she got to the point where she couldn't um, be beaten. Okay. Now I'm just going to take a step back, and you'll notice that these three peaks are all pink. Now this suggests that during this event, the users we can identify as female used more positive language than their male counterparts. And pretty almost consistently throughout, actually. And very noticeably so. And there is enough difference between those two groups to be confident that we are classifying a, a real difference for me. Um, if we were classifying people randomly and not categorizing them correctly, there would be no discernible pattern, it would be random. So for me, that's um, evidence towards the fact that there is something in there, so it needs refinement. There are issues around what sentiment analysis is really doing, and I've had, I know, conversations with linguists who hate it, and I kind of think they have a point. But when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of data points and trying to process them in real time, this is a quick and dirty, admittedly, way of getting some data. And again, the fact that we can see real differences suggests that it is picking up on something, particularly when it's tied to real-world events. Yes, OK. So sentiment peaks at real-world events. That's an interesting finding. Sentiment differs between men and women. The one thing I should really point out is that this is likely event specific. Um, you might not find the difference at another event, at the Rio Olympics. You might find that um, men peak over women or whatever. The, the point of Twitter data is that it's specific within a particular context, within a particular happening. And we always have to bear that in mind when we're trying to generalize. We can't say that women are always more positive in their language than men without doing something much more comprehensive and all-encompassing. Okay. Now, I'll make a few notes on location. There are at least three types of sources of location in Twitter data that we can use, and I'm going to move through them. Um, in sense of utility, in the same way that with quantitative data we have interval, ordinal, and nominal, um, and intervalism has more utility and more information than ordinal and ordinal more than nominal, we have almost a hierarchy of data available to us. So, for example, we have geotag tweets. Now, these are tweets made by individuals, and when they are made, the exact location of the user is recorded. This accounts for anywhere between 1 and 2% of the data. It depends on the events. If you're at, again, the Olympic Stadium, you might be more likely to have geotagging turned on than if you're just tweeting, generally commuting to work. Um, it, the rates do differ, depend on the context. This data is incredibly useful because geography provides a key for us to locate tweets, which are generally um, lacking in context, with the context of the geographical area that they're in. For example, someone tweeting that they don't feel safe and they have geotagging switched on, we can look at the area they're in when they tweeted that, we can look at the crime statistics, we can deprivation rates, we can look at all manner of things, population density, 
Um, we can look at whether people voted in or out of Brexit. We could look at perhaps attitudes in the local authority towards migration and so on and so forth. Now, because we have point geotag data, we can locate someone in the lowest possible geography, so output area, for those of you familiar with it. Now, one of the scary things about this is that if someone has geotagging switched on and if they tweet 20 times a day, you can pretty much follow their journey through a city or any geographical area and see where they are. So there are issues around um, consent and informed consent here, which um, we're dealing with an academic community. And if anybody's interested in that, I can direct them to lots of different resources on whether users actually understand the type of data they're producing or not. Okay, um, fab. So here we have a map which is just some geotag data to show you probably what you'd expect of um, what loosely um, corresponds with Twitter use, so Europe, North America, South America. Um, it's hard to tell in this map, but I will note that there is a lack of um, density in China and they have alternative platforms there like um, Weibo, inside of Weibo. So Twitter use is not universal. It's may be particularly appropriate for um, studies using um, Western countries, so certainly North America is fine, Europe is generally fine, um, UK certainly, and so forth. The dots you can see elsewhere that aren't on the map, um, I am reliably informed, tend to refer to the shipping routes, or people tweeting on flights who probably shouldn't be. So I mean, there's, there's some interesting discussion there about um, when people tweet and whether they should. But it's interesting to see. Um, before I go on to the slide, I've just moved on to the other two types of geography. So in the metadata you get on description field, people sometimes have a location. So they'll say Manchester, London, Cardiff, or whatever. But that data is problematic because you don't know if that's where someone's from, if it's where they work, if it's the area they identify with, or where they actually are. That's the first problem. They might even be abroad on holiday at a conference tweeting something and their data says they actually should be in Manchester. The other problem is that Manchester, London, Cardiff are not really useful um, geographical units because they're massive urban areas. If someone says they're from Truro in Cornwall, for instance, maybe that's more useful, smaller area. Um, but if someone says they're in London, you can't locate them within a parliamentary constituency, for instance, if they're talking about vote intention and so forth. So that's the next level. The, the lowest level, um, and it's more for people interested in linguistics and natural language processing, is mundane references to geography. So um, just up the road from me or close to where I live. Those things are only usually at the reference point, i.e. where they are at the time of tweeting. Um, but there is potential there for, you know, just by the pub, by the train station, and trying to work out if that data can be meaningful or useful in any way. So obviously the most useful data, based on what I said, is the geotag data. The issue is that the people who switch geotagging on are not a random sample of the Twitter population. Um, the Twitter population not a random sample of the UK population either. But there is a tendency in studies to use geotag data because it's the most useful, but we need to be aware that male users are disproportionately more likely to use geotagging. Geotaggers do tend to be older users. We'll talk a bit about the age distribution of Twitter users on the next slide. Um, occupational group has an impact. And also geotaggers have different user interface languages. So one of the pieces of information you get is a language of interface. I think there's like 20 or maybe even 40 different language interfaces. And there's also, of course, the language of the tweet, which is something different again. And if you do that and you can look at the papers for how we've identified this, um, you see differences in rates. Um, often the differences between one category and the next are quite small, um, but because there are a lot of data points, they are statistically significant. You know, we're, we're pretty confident that the differences are real, even if they're small. There's an interesting discussion to be had on the side about what statistical significance means statistical significance means um, at all when you've got so many data points. Um, it's more effect sizes actually which are useful, but I mean, we can, that's maybe for another time. Okay, so that's location. What I'm presenting to you here is the age distribution of Twitter users, for those we can identify, which is the bottom part of the graph. 
and the top part of the graph is um, age distribution according to the census. And what you can see very simply is a clear peak of youthfulness in Twitter users, which is not surprising. There are a few things to take from this, though. Um, that if you look at the number of users over 30, it's a small proportion, um, but there are still millions and millions of users. So a small proportion of a very big number is still a big number. So there are still tens, hundreds of thousands of users over the age of 50 in the UK, we think, that use Twitter. Um, so that's still a big sample. The other thing that I've heard people talk about, and <clears throat> I need to replicate this study um, maybe now or in a few years' time to see if it's happening, is that perhaps younger people are no longer signing on to Twitter. And what we'll actually see is the peak in age will shift to the right. It'll just continue rather than peter out. So it's not that there is a, a young cohort of people who are constantly signing up. There is actually a generational effect, and that generation may stay on Twitter. So that's a hypothesis I heard a few people say, and it'll be interesting to find out. The other thing I should point out is that um, Twitter terms of service mean you have to be 13 or above to use the platform, hence the cutoff at 13. It's entirely possible there are a lot of people who are younger than 13 but had to put their date of birth as showing them as 13 to be on here. So there's, there's opportunity there for identity play as well. And the way we identify age is um, that sim very simply people write their age on Twitter. And they say X years old and with some simple pattern matching you can pick that up. Um, very small proportion of usable age data on about 0.35% of Twitter users we could identify as being in the UK. Very small proportion, again, of a large number. Um, there is some evidence to suggest, perhaps, that there is a preponderance of younger users reporting their age and that older users are more reticent to do so. There's a little bit of evidence appearing around that. So again, this is about social desirability, about behavior online, about creation of a virtual identity and that this may not actually be representing what is actually going on, it's only those we can identify. So it's work in progress in that sense. Now, the final one is class and occupation. So what you can see in the graph, um, the lighter gray bars are what we think the um, profile by class looks like, excluding students and um, not classified users. And the darker gray is um, the proportion of class based on census data. Um, this is difficult. The way we do it is looking for occupational terms that match with the SOC codes provided by the ONS. And then we map them onto simplified uh, social class. So there's a lot of assumptions and steps there. Um, without going into too much detail, the technical details in the paper, including an evaluation of where we think we got it right and where we think it wrong is that it's generally quite easy to identify Twitter users um, in professions, um, teacher, nurse, doctor. And perhaps those are all, and journalists and so on, perhaps those are also the people that are more likely to be using Twitter to present a professional identity. The issue we have, and the big, the big issue that's hardest to get around is when people talk about a hobby, such as photographer or writer, on their profile. It's not their occupation, but a lot of those people um, can be in group two, and therefore we have an over-representation of people as we're confusing hobbies with occupations. And there's a quite a bit of discussion in that paper about where we can be probably reasonably certain that our estimates are correct based on the types of um, jobs and occupations that exist within particular groups. <clears throat> 